And if you're listening to me today and you're not right with God, God loves even the worst sinner so much that He gave His holy, only begotten Son just for the worst sinner in the world so that they could be saved. Okay, and it's a free gift. So I'm going to preach on that this morning. Let's take our Bibles, Judges chapter 6. This is, uh, this is kind of what I had not was trying to do last week. I hurt real bad. And uh, it wasn't until Tuesday that I felt any amount better. I appreciate everybody's prayers for me. Uh, but Judges chapter 6, verse 17. Let's read the Word of God this one. Do you believe the Bible? Say amen. You should, because we're not going to preach out anything else. Amen. So verse 17, he said unto him, this is, Gideon's having his talk with the angel of the Lord. And he's wanting to know if he has the right God. And he said unto him, if now I found grace in thy sight, underline grace. Because what God is going to do for Gideon and for Israel is unmerited favor. Israel is in the hands of the Midianites because of their sin. They do not deserve to be rescued and they do not deserve to be saved. That's us. Amen? When God found us, we were not at our best. We were at our worst. So he said, now if I found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee. And bring forth my present. Underline that. And set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. Verse 19. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah of flour. We found out last week that was a bushel basket full of cakes. Okay. St. Louis Bread Company has never done that. Amen. We miss the days, Ian, when you used to bring over bushel baskets of leftover. Oh, no, I, I think we ought to keep it going. Amen. So he brought in a, a bushel basket, an ephah of flour and flesh. He put it in a basket. And he put the broth in a pot and brought it unto, the, unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. He wasted that good Stock. He could have made stew out of that. He could have made dipping sauce for that. What they call au jus. It's basically just grease. Amen. But it tastes good. Pour out the broth and did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand. Touched the flesh and unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock. And consumed the flesh and unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon. Here it is right here. When Gideon perceived. That he was an angel of the Lord. Gideon understood that he was dealing with the right God. Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah with God's name. Shalom means peace. By the way, this is one of seven times that the name Jehovah is in your King James Bible. I think that's the right amount. Amen? Amen. Unto this day, it is yet in Ophrah of the Abbey Ezraites. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless. Thank you, Lord, for blessing what you did last Sunday. I thank you, God, that in my inability, God, you were able to speak to someone, to deal with someone, to help someone. And Father, just because I feel good, that doesn't mean that the message, Lord, is my responsibility, because it's not. The message, Lord, and preaching it, and using it to reach into somebody's life today, never was based upon my ability. It's always, Lord, how you preach and how your spirit moves and what, Father, you have to say to the people on this side and the people on this side and the people on the internet and the people in Kenya 
God, it is your spirit that is going to say what needs to be said uniquely to every individual that's part of this service today. And Father, I rest in that, and I pray, dear God, that you would speak to every heart. God, teach us, Father, that we never, ever had enough to give you, and we never will. So, Father, even that which we present to you, Lord, is as nothing. And that's how we know that we have the right God on our side. It's the God that doesn't need our gifts and won't accept our gifts because it's not about what we owe you. It's always about what you have given to us It's not our gift, it's your gift. Father, teach us, Lord, each one in your own way, God, speak to hearts. I pray that you'd bless your word. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. Watch up here on the screen as I move through the word of God. Very quickly this morning, I'm just going to shout, give give some verses of how God led me into this message. God, this is something that God taught me years ago. In fact, I, I first heard this and never really thought about it. Till I heard Brother Reg Kelly, uh, who, by the way, is coming here this week. He has written a book. We helped him get that thing ready for print. It's now been published. And he's going to come up Tuesday. So everybody that's helped out on that gets their free copy. And I think you might be able to get him to sign it for you. I'm not sure. But we talked about it. And I'm going to have him on Pastor Mike Online Tuesday so he can talk about what's in the book. I encourage you to get a copy of this book. It's, again, it's not, we're not getting anything out of it as far as money or anything like that. But the message that's in this book, I mean, it'll reach your heart. And he deals with just about every issue that he and I both have preached on. He deals on our nation's issues, land confiscation, government intrusion, false converts, false prophets, false Bibles... He deals with it all in there. And there's a salvation message. So I just encourage you maybe to get a copy if you like it. Maybe get another for somebody else. Christmas time's coming up. Amen. But anyway, I want you to listen to the word of God this morning. God does not receive our gifts. For any kind of merit or any kind of acknowledgement, or you might, some people might think that if they give God a lot of money, that that will sway God's attention to them, and God will return some sort of favor to them. I know there's preachers out there that preach that on TV, that if you write their ministry a thousand dollar check, well, you just hold your breath because there's going to be tenfold money coming to you in the mail any second now. And there's gullible people that are thinking that God accepts our gifts as payment to sway God's judgment. If I had a situation where I had a court situation and I went to the judge to his house with a big sack full of thousand dollar bills and I dropped that in his hand, I said, judge, here's your money. I want the judgment to go my way. That's a crime. Just me going to a judge, even without money, just me going to a judge who is overseeing a case of mine is illegal and it's against the law. And if the judge sat there and talked to me any time at all, he's guilty of breaking the law. We do not want judges that can be swayed by gifts. Somebody say amen. Exodus 23, 8. Thou shalt take no gift. For the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. This is why no preacher should ever find out who gives what in that church. That should not be his business. He should never look into that. He should never be uh, handling all the money, counting out the money, looking at the checks. Oh, I see so-and-so gives this. Well, I think I'll put them on a committee. That should never happen. Proverbs 17, 23, a wicked man taketh the gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. You know what that is, don't you? Come here, come here. Take that. Right? 
He's got money hid down in his pocket. And he's going to go over to a judge or he's going to go to a ruler of some kind. Or he's going to go over to his boss or whatever and hand him money on the side to where he's going to now favor what I want. He's going to do what I want him to do. No member of Congress should ever receive gifts from any company in America. It has repeatedly come up to Congress to pass legislation that would forbid companies from donating to congressmen. Should be illegal. And every time it comes up, Congress votes it down. I wonder why. Those men and those women in Congress know that it's the large corporations that give large sums of money to their election campaign, send them on these junkets, send them on these little retreats that they got all over the place as because they want that congressman to grant them favoritism when it comes to legislation and how the money is going to be given out. And it ought to be illegal. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 7. Surely oppression maketh the wise man mad and a gift destroyeth the heart. This Bible's right. When it comes to us trying to sway people by giving them money, when it comes to people trying to influence police officers, bribing cops, giving judges drugs like they did over here in Illinois a few years ago. You remember that? That judge died of a drug overdose in a cabin, a weekend cabin. There was th two judges and a prosecutor in there doing drugs. And they were on a regular basis getting their drugs from drug pushers in that county in exchange for these drug pushers not being arrested and put in prison. And one of the judges ended up dying of an overdose. They got caught. The other judge is in prison right now. And that's where he ought, he ought to stay there. Amen. Listen, that makes me angry to find out that congressmen and police officers and judges and people, mayors and governors are taking money and bribes and they call it gifts. But it's meant to influence them when government ought to be of the people and by the, by the people and for the people. Not for the corporation. Can I hear you say amen? The same thing applies in the ministry. When people in a church... Make it known how much they give. A pastor friend of mine left a church. They was going to vote him out. And he left before they had a chance to. Because he found out that there was a man in that church. A wealthy man. Who was funneling money from his company. Into the church. Taking it back out over time. He was money laundering in that church. So he had to pay taxes on it. The pastor of the church found out about it. Sat down, confronted the man, and the man just kind of sat back and he said, I thought you were smarter than that. The pastor said, what do you mean? He said, why don't you just take the money and keep your mouth shut like all the other pastors did? That man was not sitting on any committee in that church, but he had family members on every board and committee in that church. From behind the scenes, he influenced Every move that that church made. And they found out that for years, he had been laundering money through that church and getting away with hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, every year he was doing this. And as soon as this pastor friend of mine became the pastor, the man immediately said, D did I hear your kids are wanting to go to Christian school? He said, how much does it cost? I'll pay the tuition for the whole year for all of your children. The pastor was going, oh my goodness, what a blessing. His red flag should have went up immediately because that man was trying to use that money to influence that pastor. It's wicked. It's wicked for anybody in the congregation to do it and it's wicked for any pastor to sway his mind, his theology, his preaching based upon the money that's coming in. Okay, I hear God's people say amen. So you understanding now why when Gideon brought his gift, why the angel of the Lord did what he did to it. <laughs> now it's gone. The angel did not drink the broth. He did not eat the flesh. He did not make him sandwiches out of it and eat it. 
He burned it up and it was completely gone and now he's gone. Then Gideon understood, I have the right God now. This is the God who will not let me pay him off to sway his opinion of me. This is the God who is going to give a gift to me without any repayment of me paying him back whatsoever. I used to say years ago that I owed God a great debt. Now, it's okay, to, I guess, to feel like that every now and then, but the truth of it is, theologically, you owe God nothing. Do you believe that? You owe Him nothing. He will accept nothing from you. The only requirement for salvation is what? Faith. That's it. Will you believe what God said? Do you believe what God said? Say amen. What you gave, and if you notice, whenever there's an offering going on, I'm busy with something. And I don't go to John and Sterling later and say, uh, how much did uh, so-and-so give? I don't go to Rose and say, Rose, give me a, a report of who's paying what. I made up my mind years ago, I don't want to know, I never want to know. And I don't know, sitting here, who gives and who doesn't. I never, ever, ever want that information. You know why? Because I know me. And it might be something in my nature to where I might either gravitate to you or pull away from you because of what you give or what you don't give. And I don't want to be that way. It wouldn't be right, wouldn't be good, and it wouldn't be fair. We didn't ask John to be a deacon because we found out he's the biggest tither in the church. Never came up, did it? How much he gives. In fact, we didn't, we didn't even ask. That's actually a requirement that you tithe, but we didn't even ask because we just figured he's been serving the church already without a title and without payment and without recognition. That's what everybody should do, including me. Deuteronomy chapter 16, you might want to turn there very quickly. Verse 18, Judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout all thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. You know what that word means? Twist. We're not allowed to twist judgment based upon gifts, bribes, payments, money received whatsoever. Rick Warren, when he went to start a church, picked the wealthiest county in America. Orange County, California, has probably more millionaires per population. I guarantee you they got more millionaires in Orange County, California than there is in Jefferson County, Missouri. And he brags about how successful he is because he went to these wealthy people and asked them specifically, what would it take for me to do to get you to come to my church? And they laid out the guidelines and he did exactly that. And lo and behold, they started coming. And as they came, guess what they did? Start writing checks. Putting it in the offering plate. He had it figured right. That's exactly what they did. Why did he do it? Where he did it? He did it for the money. No other reason. So God said in verse 19, Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise. 
and pervert the words of the righteous. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. God made it a, requ a requirement. We're going to keep money out of it. We're going to keep gifts out of it. Judges should not take gifts. Judges should not take bribes. Judge judges and congressmen and mayors and senators and governors should never be sent on a free vacation somewhere by some company or by some by one person. Should never happen. Here's God's feeling about money and gifts. Acts chapter 8. Turn there. This is a good story. Turn your Bible there. You ought to read this. This is how God, listen, this is how God sees it. When them clowns get on TV and those Christian, so-called Christian TV shows at TBN, and they start telling you about how if you write such and such check to their ministry, why if you sow a seed of a, a thousand, in fact, a thousand, I, God's telling me right now that some of you have got five thousand dollars just laying around. Oh, no, 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 listen. Oh, there's somebody out there with $10,000. You can, if you sow that seed in this ministry, why God, God sees it as a loan. You're loaning God money and God has to give it back with interest. They're turning God into your slave because the Bible says that the borrower is servant to the lender. And what they're telling you is, is that because you give God gifts, He has to now favor you because of that gift, and He has to give you more than what you gave Him. You've heard me say it over and over again. We come in this church, and we sing these old songs, and we lift up our heart to the Lord, and we don't do it so that God will return a blessing to us. We do it, why? Because He already has given us the blessing. He gave us the blessing before we sang about it. He gave us the blessing before we got down our knees, bowing our eyes out, saying, God, thank you for that. Bought bawled my eyes out last night. God reminded me of something. Seven years ago, seven years ago, the last word that I heard my dad say was, Amen. And then he died. And I just bawled and cried over that. God gave me that as a gift. Not because I was some great person. Not because I thanked him. Not because I rejoiced. Not because I tithed or anything like that. It was just a gift that God gave me. What do I have to give God that is equal to the gift that He gave me. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing to give my God for the gift that He's given me. And He keeps blessing me. I'll never catch up. I'll never get paid off. But I don't owe God. It wasn't payment. And it wasn't a loan. It was God's gift to me. Unmerited. And we don't owe God a thing. Who in here, I want to see how evil your parents were. On Christmas Day, Matthew, when you opened up all those presents, did you ever find a bill from your mom and dad for the presents? Boy, there went the blessing of that song. Just shot out the door right then and there. All the things that Lisa and I have given to, and still give to our kids. And now to our grandkids. I still got candy in my pocket, guys, by the way. Look at there. I'm going to tell you something. Look at here, Roy. When we came back... We stopped at them Amish stores, and I knew they had a ton of candy. It's salvage groceries is what it is. I bought $100 worth of candy for all these kids. Do you know what my, my blessing is in doing it? They don't even have to tell me thank you. 
I know you're teaching them to, but they don't have to because just giving them the candy is my blessing. Because I see it in their face. And they run with it. Poor Levi, he's, he's still come up to me very quietly. And I'll give it to him and he'll turn and run. Like I'm going to snatch him bald-headed or something like that. He's not even my child. I just like him. I just give him candy. Acts chapter 8, verse 18. When Simon saw that through laying on the, hand, the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now let me tell you what Simon, why Simon offered the apostles money. Simon had just enough witchcraft and wicked heart in him that he figured that if he paid the apostles to give him this gift and he had it, then he would then turn around and charge people to give them the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you something, any church that will make a monetary requirement of anybody to receive salvation or grace from God is a thief. Why would you give money for something that God said was free? And Holy Ghost is free. It's the gift of the Holy Ghost. But he offered them money. Okay? And the apostles said, you keep your money. You choke on it. We don't want your money. The gift of God cannot be bought. Somebody say amen. Psalm chapter 50, verse 8. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. Look at verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. That means if God wants chicken, he owns all the chicken. Amen. Verse 12. Look at this in your Bible. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. If God, if God was hungry, he would never tell mankind. Why? Because if mankind fed him, then man would think that God owed him something. Because that's how our wicked nature is, is it not? God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? No! So here's Gideon. He said, I want to know that I'm talking to the right God. So he brings the gift. A false god, a devil, would have consumed the gift and wanted and demanded more. But as soon as the angel of the Lord, who I believe was Jesus, as soon as that angel of the Lord dissipated and burnt into nothing, all that Gideon brought, Gideon said, I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. I know I've got the right God. Because this God does not accept my bribes. God won't take yours either. If you put money in the plate, guess what? It's not yours anymore. Doesn't belong to you. The only reason why we keep a record of it, so you can write it off your taxes at the, year, at the end of the year if you don't. And I'm amazed at some people who call our ministry and say this little thing that we got from your church because we have to, any gift over like, how much is it, 200 some odd, 250? We have to make an IRS, we have to fill out an IRS thing and send it to them. That's something Obama made us do. We have to acknowledge it. And people will say to us, will you please stop doing that? We don't write these off on our taxes. That's not why we gave it. I like those people. I like those people. Now, my opinion is, if Caesar doesn't deserve it, he shouldn't get it. Amen? And if you want to, if the government says you can take it back from them, I'd take it back from them because you're better at that money than they are. Amen? Ezekiel 33, Therefore thou son of man say unto the children of thy people, The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Not even your good deeds. 
our payment to God. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. When I shall say to the righteous, thou shalt surely live, if he trust in his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall not be remembered, but his iniquity that he had committed, he shall die for it. Now that's how God sees your righteousness. You can be holy and right before God for seven days straight and think, boy, God's really going to bless me. I don't want to tell you the number of times I've preached the Word of God to you when the week before I had sin in my heart. I don't want to tell you that. Don't ask me. And I am just dumbfounded at the number of times people said, Pastor, that was one of the best messages I've ever heard in my life. Boy, God dealt with me. Thank you for preaching that message. And I just bawl like a little baby because I know that it wasn't me. God does not bless this church on our basis of how good we have been. He blesses this church with literally hundreds of thousands of people listening to this service right now. And ask yourself the question, if we were to go through the room and start picking out the sins that we had committed this last week, should we do that? Should we do that? Why not? The people who shook their head, you're guilty. I want to know why. You're not going to tell me, are you? So ask yourself the question, what do we deserve? With that in mind, what righteousness do we have to give to God? Because in the day, we can live holy seven days straight. On the eighth day, we're going to blow it. And God said, all that righteousness that you did before is gone. I wiped it away. Now you have nothing. First Timothy chapter 6. Perverse disputings of men and corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. Supposing that because you got... Big fat raves, you got, because you made a lot of money this last year. Oh, that must be because I'm living godly. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. There was, if where you work, there was 15 other people that got way more money than you did, and they're all whiskey drinkers and dope smokers. So what does that tell you? God, listen, there's rich people out there that don't live for God. So why do we think? That if we live for God, then God's going to pay our bills and make us wealthy. We went around the room and what I heard this morning was how God paid bills. Money just fell from heaven. What did you do to deserve it? Nothing. Verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry out nothing. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now I want, I want you to think about what Gideon gave. He's already told the angel of the Lord my family is the poorest family among the Israelites and I'm the least of the brethren. But he goes out and he takes a kid and he kills it. He brings in a bushel basket full of baked goods and brought that broth. What else did he have? He probably had very little, if anything, left. And God destroyed it right in front of him. And then Gideon rejoiced because he realized he was dealing with the God who will not accept his gift. I want you to live right. God wants you to live holy lives. God wants you to live clean lives. God will chastise you if you don't. But not even our parents treated us the way that sometimes we expect God to treat us. 
when your parents threatened that they were going to take all your Christmas presents away if you didn't be good, they never did it. They gave them to you anyway. Didn't she, Melissa? Hebrews 10, 8, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not. Neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. God accepted. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Theologically, in the Old Testament, how many of the sacrifices that they made in the Old Testament law, how many of those sacrifices did God actually accept for the remission of the sins of the people of Israel? The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, the Bible says. They sacrifice daily. They sacrifice yearly. Thousands and thousands and thousands of sacrifices were made by the law of God. And none of them atoned for the sins of Israel. Only one did. Think about that. Matthew 9, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Mark 12, 33, and to love him with all your heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. God's not taking your gift. Purge out the old, therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump as you are an unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Ephesians 5, 2, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. I want to ask you a question. Who in here has God ever told you, you have an enemy, but I want you to love them and treat them better than they treated you? Has God ever told you that in your life? Raise your hand. You know what God was doing? God was teaching you how it is that he loves you. And he gives all the candy to all of his children when they have done nothing. My daughters will come in on a certain day. Dad, Uriah is not to get any candy today. He was bad in the car. And I say to them in love, Dad has superpowers. And your powers are useless against me. I'm going to give them candy because I love them. But dad, I'm not, I'm not but dad. I give them candy even behind their back because I love them. And I don't need anything back. I don't need a thank you. It's cute when I get it. I like the thank yous but I don't need them. And I'll keep giving, and I'll keep giving, and I'll keep giving till I got nothing to give. Because I love them. And what God has given you, you've deserved none of it, and you never will. If God makes you an overnight billionaire, you didn't deserve it. You told God, thank you for that new job you got. You didn't deserve that. I mean, I'm glad you got it. I'm not being mean to you, Brian. I love you. You didn't, have, you didn't have that coming. Ian, God brought you down here. Up here. You were down there. Over. He did. And Ian's never told me much of anything about his past. I've never asked. But I got it figured that it was pretty bad. Just by looking at you. I'm telling you, he was, he was a mess. God brought him here, gave him a church that loves him. And God gave that to you. And you didn't deserve any of it. It's the God who won't take your money. That's the God you serve. It's the God who won't take your 20 years straight Sunday school attendance as some benefit, at, like you're better than everybody else. That's not the God you serve. The God you serve is the God who blessed you when you didn't do, when you didn't give, when you didn't obey, when you didn't sacrifice, that's the God that loves you. Man, I got to stop preaching. 
but I got all this candy left over. Who wants it? Brian, look at you. You got to be at least 12 and under for this one. That wasn't yours. Go ahead, Hope. Here you go. Okay. That was the best throw ever. Hit him in the hand. Here you go, bub. Okay, it's the last one. I've got more in my office. You'll have to see me after church. I want you to stand to your feet. I'll get you. I'll get you. Don't worry. The devil took it. Let's bow our heads. I don't know. I don't know if last Sunday's version of it was better than this Sunday. I don't know. But I, I gave the scriptures. I, I gave the scriptures that I wanted to give. Don't listen. Don't beat on yourself. Bow, bow your heads. I want you to listen to me now for a minute. Don't be so hard on yourself. Thinking. That you're not going to get prayers answered, or God's not going to help you, or God's not going to heal you, or God's not going to do this, or God's not going to do that, because you've been bad. That's not how God chooses to answer our prayers, to give us grace. To pay our bills, to heal our bodies, to answer our prayers. I know we sometimes we make deals with God. God, I'll be good for a week if you'll do this. Oh God, I'll give you this if you'll do this. Or God, I'll what? That I mean, that sounds good, but God just don't accept that stuff. If He's going to bless you, He's going to do it because He loved you. When the Israelites were at the water's edge of the Red Sea and Pharaoh was coming at them, the Bible says they murmured and complained. And that didn't stop God from opening the Red Sea. So I'm just telling you, make sure you're serving the right God and make sure you got the right God. It's the God that doesn't accept your offering. It's the God that won't take your bribe. It's the God that's not influenced by your righteous deeds. What he's going to do in your life is going to be good. And he's going to do it on the simple basis. The fact that he loves you. And God only accepted one sacrifice. And it was the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to leave this time open. If you feel led, you want to come and pray, you come and pray. I just want to give that opportunity. But I want us to bow our heads this morning. And at least tell God thank you for what you have and what you were able to give and all the blessings that you have received that you know were not deserved. I can tell you that some of God's greatest blessings on my life were when I was at my worst, not at my best. And I know God has done a tremendous amount of things to me and with me and through me. But it's not a debt that I owe Him. But I love him just the same. 
because God has been good to me and God has been good to you. And he will continue that without your gifts, without your presence. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for the, for the one gift. The one gift. The one that you received. The one that you honored. The one that man was waiting for. And that is the unspeakable gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Unspeakable in that God, a thousand eternities would not be enough time to praise you and to thank you for what you've done. And God, when we think about who we are, we stand in shame before you. Ashamed, God, that we have not been better to you. Ashamed, God, that we have not given more to you. Ashamed, God, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. And yet you love us and accept us. And Father, help us, dear God, to, number one, believe in that love and trust in that love. And number two, God, please help us to love other people the same way. People that don't deserve our love. And God, that's very hard for me to do. God, it's easy to love my friends, but I have a hard time loving my enemies. I get bitter. I want to get vengeful and spiteful. And God, I need help to be like you are, and that is to love them without condition. So God, please forgive me and forgive us, Lord, for holding grudges. And for not loving the people, Lord, that we hate. The people who hate us, God, help, them to love, help us to love them back. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless the words that were spoken. Bless, Father, may your spirit deal with each heart. And God, speak to them, Lord, the things you would want them to know. Things you want to say. Thank you, God, for meeting with us today. We love you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Shake hands and be friendly. You're